Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Plant Healthcare PLC investor presentation prior to its AGM on the 14th of June. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions encouraged can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and will be notified once they're ready for your review. We'd also like to remind that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Chris Richards, CEO, and Jeff Tweedy, COO of Plant Healthcare PLC. Good afternoon. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for Jeff and myself to be presenting to this group uh, again. Um, we're pleased to present an update on where we are this year. As Paul has mentioned, we have our AGM next week on Monday, June the 14th. Um, and these are slides that we would otherwise present at an AGM. I'm sorry that due to COVID restrictions, we're not able to invite uh, investors to the AGM, and particularly because a number of investors did say through Investor Meet Company that they would be interested in attending the AGM. We thought it would be very important to provide investors with, with this opportunity. So please uh, don't hold back from uh, asking questions, which we will attempt to answer at the end of the meeting. So this is an update. There are no new specific results um, in this presentation. We will be making a, a trading statement on our first half uh, trading uh, at the end of July, as we normally do, and we'll be presenting results at that time. But we'll just make some commentary on current trading uh, during the course of this, this presentation. So um, let's get to it. If I present the slides uh, here, uh, this is just a reminder uh, of Plant Healthcare. Plant Healthcare, we are uh, into cost-effective products of sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture is increasingly important. Agriculture is moving to more sustainability, and that's driving global demand for biological solutions, which is our market, of greater than 16% per annum. And we believe passionately uh, that we should be supporting agriculture, conventional agriculture, uh, to become more sustainable, by providing highly cost-effective products. As a reminder, uh, more than 95% of global agriculture is not organic. So it provides A, a much bigger commercial target, and B, uh, <clears throat> it, it make a more significant contribution to sustainability than focusing just on organic. So we'd like you to think, investors, about the business in two parts, the commercial business, and our new pre-tech technology, our vaccines for plants. The commercial business, we're selling proven products with very strong return on investment for growers. Uh, we are on track to meet uh, market expectations this year and again as last year for the commercial business to be profitable and cash generative based on tremendous market access that we have to large markets. Um, Jeff Tweedy will talk in a minute about our sales trends this year, but last year in our core markets, we doubled sales, uh, particularly of Harp and Alpha Beta, which is a, a, a high margin, 70% margin product. And we are really excited, we continue to be excited uh, about pre-tech, our vaccines for plants, lower cost, higher potency, greater stability and ease of use compared with Harp and Alpha Beta, offering outstanding benefits to growers we believe potentially disruptive platform technology in which we've invested well over $20 million since uh, 2012. And we're targeting very large markets with more than $5 billion of value with our first ever pre-tech product launch uh, in the second half of this year. So moving on to the next slide, investors gave us tremendous support for a fundraise uh, back in March, April, uh, we, we raised growth $9.8 million, heavily oversubscribed by new investors. We've got a great shareholder register now. Um, and based on that uh, better uh, uh, cash uh, reserves, more than $12 million in the bank, uh, we are now making measured increases in investments 
to deliver accelerated growth. And as a reminder, we went for that fundraise because we decided that we weren't investing enough, particularly in the very, very exciting prospects for pre-tech and that $5 billion opportunity. So we're now making uh, modest additional investments, but focusing on targeting cash positive within our current cash reserves, which leads us to focus on driving revenue in the 22 to 24 period particularly. So we will burn more cash in 21 than we had previously said, uh, but that is because we're investing for growth. And we're investing in driving successful pre-tech product launches, particularly the launch of Saori in Brazil later this year, which, although small scale in terms of revenue, we believe will have a big impact uh, on the business. And then moving towards um, the registration and launch of PHE 279 in the USA. And then beyond that, building out the pre-tech product pipeline, uh, particularly submitting for PHE 949 <coughs> registration in the US and in South America. And we're now making important progress uh, with our uh, strategy for entering Europe, and Jeff will talk about a little bit more about this in, in a minute. And, um, and we've made a big step as well with appointing Dr. Patrick Doyle as our Vice President in charge of product development and regulatory. We're very excited to have Patrick on board. Um, the, uh, the appendix to these slides, there are bi uh, bios of all of the, of the executives in the company. Um, Patrick comes to us with extensive global experience um, of development and regulatory, and he will drive our product pipeline uh, even more strongly over the next uh, few years than we were able to uh, previously. So that being said, I'll pass over to Jeff uh, to talk uh, about our revenue growth uh, this year. Jeff. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to Investor Meet the opportunity to come back and speak with investors. The next couple of slides, I'm going to really focus in on our core markets and talk about what we're seeing early signs this year. Um, in the past, as I've mentioned in the past, U.S. corn is uh, a key priority for us. We had really good growth in 2000, almost doubled our sales, and it's driven by uh, yield and uh, increased yield and taller corn, which is a great return on investment for the grower. We've had strong market uh, support this year uh, with demand. Corn commodity prices are very high. And right now we're seeing one of the worst droughts that we've seen in some time. Uh, so early, early indications are is that our Harpin product used in corn is performing well. And we've got a nice uh, testimonial from a grower in Minnesota where they've used it over a number of years. We believe, again, that this is uh, a $5 million opportunity for us. Corn's a very large market, and uh, if we were to get 5% uh, share of that, that would be $5 million for us. Secondly is our specialty crop uh, market. This is with Will Borellis, uh, and we launched uh, Harpen Alpha Beta this year into California. First time ever, it's the world's largest uh, crop market for specialty crops. And right now, early season looks like we're having a very good run in California. Um, and uh, even greater success in the markets of Oregon, Washington, on pears, cherries, and grapes. So we're, we're really excited about uh, the way the season is setting up with Wilbur Ellis. The third market is uh, Brazil and sugarcane. We continue to see outstanding benefits for the grower, and they are experiencing a drought right now that they're calling the 100-year drought. So that has really delayed a lot of the uh, harvest. And it's also delayed some uh, uh, purchases of our product as it comes into the market, plus the impacts of COVID. So COVID is still a real issue in Brazil right now. It's limited our ability uh, to see growers and to see customers. And so that's holding back some of the uh, sales we're seeing so far. If we turn to the next slide. When we look at Europe, I'm really excited about this market. We're having a great year in Europe so far, really strong sales, especially on our fruit crops um, and also in citrus in the in Spain. If you look at our sales in the UK, we doubled in 2020 on ground, and that trend is continuing in, tw in 2021. 
Uh, and then we've had a return of the amenity market, which is the market where Harpen is used on professional turf, um, soccer fields, golf courses. Uh, that market was basically uh, wiped out last year, but it's coming back strong. And uh, we're really moving forward with a stronger presence in Europe. We're getting very close to signing up a, a large distributor that will really expand our market presence, not only in the current markets that we're at today, but also future markets that we want to enter. And I'll just touch a little bit. We've got some testimonials on some of the uses that's happened this year. Grapes, we use it on grape. We use Harpen on grapes to improve uh, calcium, which helps with shelf life, but also coloring. Uh, we've got excellent results on potatoes, as I mentioned. And this is from uh, some trial work that was done in Poland. We're not currently selling in Poland today, but if once we achieve a registration there, that's one of the largest market for potatoes. So the, the results that we're seeing in the UK today would really transfer there. And then lastly, on strawberries, uh, we've seen uh, fruit uh, increase a number of plants up to 30% and weight up to 50%. And these last two trials and, and testimonials that have come in are some articles that have recently been published uh, with uh, use from the agronomist. These agronomists are with uh, Agri, and that's one of the largest distributors in the UK. Lastly, I'll touch on our Mexico business. It is our largest business. Uh, lower export prices for vegetables in the northern uh, regions of Mexico have challenged some of the revenue early on. We do believe, however, in June, July, and August, those will start to uh, normalize uh, with sales in the berries. There seems to be a strong market there. We've got good presence with not only our third-party products, but also with ARP and Alpha Beta on those crops. And I'll turn it back to Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate those comments. Um, just a reminder, everybody, about our pre-tech uh, pipeline. And uh, you will remember that uh, we said a couple of months back that we already had funding for the launch of Saori in Brazil, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a minute. Uh, and also that we have submitted for registration of PHC 279 in the USA, uh, and we're working uh, in a joint development agreement with Wilbur Ellis uh, on PHC 279, so targeting fruit and vegetable disease management principally. Uh, and these are very large markets, uh, and we're planning, um, in the early stages, of planning multiple launches uh, with, with Wilbur Ellis. Then the, the lower part of this chart uh, I've called it this time under evaluation, and we're starting to fund more of this work. Uh, a series of other products, PHC 404, but particularly 949, uh, and we will be uh, submitting for registration in the, in the U.S. before the end of this year and in Brazil uh, early next year. Uh, I can tell you our partner, Wilbur Ellis, in that joint development agreement is very excited about 949. Um, a specialist in the nematode market, and we've also got a good progress we're making in South America with the same product. Um, and these are very, very large market opportunities uh, for, for, for nematode uh, products. And finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are making good progress in deciding how to uh, get more traction in, in Europe, and we will make a decision by the end of this year in exactly how we'll move forward on the regulatory side uh, with pre-tech in Europe. Um, but I'd like to pass back to Jeff, uh, who is now um, also leading the plans to launch uh, Sauri in Brazil. Jeff, back to you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, this is really exciting. Uh, I think when we spoke back in March to the Investor Meet group, we were just starting to get the early indications of product performance. So most of those are in now. Uh, and we had really good performance this past year with Saori uh, as a seed treatment. And uh, it's put on the seed, and what it helps is it triggers the plant's natural immunity to really uh, increase vigor, but also release the, uh, resist these diseases, which you can see in the picture at the bottom left. It has the potential to reduce fungicide use, and our average yield increase this year was over 4%, which is around $80 uh, a hectare. I, I'm really excited about it. I think the performance has been great. Uh, and we had a number of trials out this year uh, through uh, several of the states in Brazil. And we've really spent a lot of time working on the positioning. 
Uh, we have a tagline at the bottom, looking after your soy crop when you're not there. And what that means is it's put on as a seed treatment. It activates the plant then, and you're seeing the protection that go out throughout the season. The other great thing that we found this year is that we tested for other diseases, which are now becoming more prevalent in the early season, what they call the vegetative state. Now we'll have to submit those, uh, the data from that to add those to the registration and further build that out. But uh, that was really important data that we achieved this year. Um, and our cooperators were very excited about that. These diseases are becoming more prevalent uh, than uh, even the Asian soy rust. So our position is it protects against the a plant against this disease, maintains that protection, providing a healthier crop throughout the season. Um, and really a sustainability message goes along with that. This is a greener product, uh, reduce the use, you reduce the need for these toxic uh, fungicides that are used. And the result for a grower is significant yield increase with a strong return on investment. We are planning a launch in uh, this in October, which would be the beginning of the soybean season. It will be a small launch. And our, our goal is really to get with the key growers and get you know two to 300 growers using this product. We wanna get broad adoption with growers uh, in Brazil and get exposure to it and really build that awareness. Um, that'll either be done through what we call seed multipliers or potentially a, uh, a, single, a single partner who has a national presence. We still have a number of uh, discussions that are going on there, uh, but we have a couple of options. Now, I wouldn't expect large sales dollars in 2021 from this. Again, we have a limited supply, but in two to three years out, I would expect this is going to be you know, several million dollar business for the plant health care organization. And it's a, really an exciting market to be in. Chris, I'll pass back to you. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. So um, just two last slides, everybody. First of all, how should do we would you we like you to judge us over the next um, year or two? Firstly, on the commercial side, we've got to deliver continued product adoption in our three core markets that Jeff has articulated uh, for you. We're making great progress this year, uh, and we hope to continue to do so. We aim to continue to do so. Signing up a major new distributor in Europe this year is an important uh, target for us. And if we do all of the things that we're planning to do, we should deliver revenue growth well above the sector average of 16 plus percent. And our commercial business needs to generate consistent profit and cash. On the pre-tech vaccines for plants, uh, we want to appoint distributors for salary in Brazil uh, for launch during third quarter. Uh, submit 949 to the EPA this year. Uh, next year, achieve the 279 registration in the US. Uh, continue to progress our joint development agreement with Wilbur Ellis and pursue further joint development agreements. Um, and finally, commence pre-tech development in Europe. And um, uh, on the launch planning side, uh, appoint a toll manufacturer for PHC 279 in 2021, strengthen our peptide IP and formulation development, and overall, very important, track to group cash positive. Uh, we are building all of these plans to take the company to cash positive within our existing uh, resources while uh, accelerating revenue growth. Uh, and then finally, as a reminder, we will publish our trading statement on first half trading uh, in late July. So the final slide here is just a very quick uh, one on the HEM itself, uh, which will be held uh, in London on Monday of next week. Uh, and again, apologies that we, we are unable to um, have more than six people, so shareholders are being asked not to attend this year. So please use this opportunity um, to ask your questions today and, and a reminder, please, to submit uh, proxy votes. So, uh, Paul, that being said, that's the end of our uh, slide presentation. So maybe we can uh, revert to uh, video uh, and um, uh, start to take some of the questions. 
Absolutely. Chris, Jeff, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, as Chris has just said, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions just by clicking on the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen, uh, typing in your question and press send. But just want the company to take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already. I'd like to remind you that a recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Chris, Jeff, perhaps before we move on to the live Q&A, we did have a pre-submitted question. Um, if I could just read this one out, if I may. Um, has the company considered adopting a sustainability framework as part of its SOP, e.g. the certified B Corporation or another appropriate system? It's clear that the company is now growing up and needs to consider advocating the sustainability identity more than it's done so, so far. Um, thanks, Paul, and, and, and thanks for that submitted question, which is a really, really good one. Um, <clears throat> it's something to which we've given a lot of thought over the last uh, few months. Um, because it's all very well us telling you that we're sustainable, but if we don't have some independent third party endorsing that, um, it's, uh, it's a weak claim, frankly. So um, we've looked at actually B Corp, and I'm not necessarily convinced that's the way forward, but we, are, we, we do have active plans to uh, obtain uh, independent third party uh, certification around our uh, sustainability profile. Um, and I, I don't want to say more at this point until we've uh, gone a little bit further in that project, uh, but it's a really good question and, and one that we intend to uh, address over the coming months. So maybe, Paul, I could pick out some of the uh, questions. Uh, please please do. If you could just click on that Q&A tab, um, say even read out who it's from and just the question so uh, everyone can hear it. That'd yeah. be great. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. And the first one, actually, I'm going to – I'll read it out, but I'm going to ask Jeff Tweedy to respond because he's, he's the guy who's uh, set this up. Uh, and the question is from Tim H., uh, which says, the company has very large margins and the profit will be very sensitive to turnover. If I could just say from my point of view, 70% margin is not, in my view, very large. Um, it's, it's a good margin and it's a basis on which to build. <laughs> These, we, we need to have good margins to, 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 to make good profits. Um, but, uh, Tim, you make a really good point. The Brazilian farmers seem to like to have the product but not to pay for it until the crops have grown. The farmers will reap a very large profit from using our products, and they should pay within 30 to 60 days. We're not a bank. We could use invoice discounting, but we, could we not JV with a bank to provide the cash which the Brazilian trading seems to require so we can grow in line with market demands. In other words, we should not limit our growth for lack of invoice financing. So, Jeff, tell us how we've approached this. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question, Tim. Um, you know, in Brazil, the average payment terms can be as high as 365 days. And so I think it's, we've, we've approached that market not to go down that path. And so we've done two things. The partner that we have in Brazil Sugarcane has access to cash and we get we get our payments from them in a much timelier manner than a year. And then second of all, we've set up uh, a factoring with several different banks that allow us to factor those receivables in case there are la longer payment terms. So it keeps our cash reserves in the bank um, and, and lets us continue to operate uh, in Brazil. It's a very important thing to have in sugarcane, and it's good that we've got that in place now as we enter the soy market in soybeans. It'll be very important there as well. So we've, we've established that. We've done that over the past 12 months, and it's working very well for us. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's a couple more questions on here on Brazil, and I, I'll take one and then pass the other one to you, Jeff, if I may. Um, Sure. The uh, Ryan N, what impact is COVID in Brazil having on your expectations on sales and your general timeline? Um, I'll take that one. The, um, it is quite clear that COVID is restricting uh, our ability uh, to do the best possible work we can on farm. Um, so uh, that does make life a, a little bit more difficult. Uh, however, um, uh, I, I have to say our Brazilian team is exceptionally good in remote working. 
um, and reaching out to customers through uh, through um, webinars and uh, social media and and all of this uh, kind of good stuff, which I'm not terribly good at, as you can see by my hesitation. Uh, but but the Brazilian team is really really good at this, and particularly Jeff and I. In fact, we've just come off a call with our Brazilian team on preparations for the Saori launch. Um, and I can tell you we've got some really, really exciting launch meetings, some of which will be virtual, some of which will be face-to-face -face or a combination of the two. Um, and I really don't think that given what we're trying to achieve this year with Saori in Brazil, I don't think it's going to hold us back. Um, and, uh, Jeff, if you disagree with that, please jump in when you answer the next question, which is from Roger F. Can you remind us on the seasonality of Brazil sugarcane sales? Yeah, so typically you would see uh, sales, the seasonality would be uh, like January, February, March, then it will tail off in what we would consider our summer months, their winter months, and then really picks back up in August through December, uh, the seasonality, and that's when the applications would be. Those are really driven off the timing of when you have sugarcane harvest, growth back or new planting, and then when the applications would go. I would add the COVID, uh, Chris mentioned COVID, the droughts having some impact as well this year because they are delaying harvest just because the cane has not grown as much. So we're seeing a delay in harvest there because of some of the drought and droughts affecting all the crops down there. But that's typically the seasonality of the business. Th thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, the next one is a really, really interesting question from John A saying, uh, hi, Chris and Jeff, for someone who hasn't followed your company, could you tell us, if possible, what realistically percent of the market do you think you can achieve? How good are your products against competitors such as Monsanto and, and Bayer? Well, I mean, we could talk a lot about this, but uh, the, um, we are a small company, and we will achieve market shares which are commensurate with our size and the size of our distribution partners. So that's why we partner with very, very strong distributors like Wilbur Ellis in the U.S. and like Copacana in, in Brazil. Wilbur Ellis has a very strong market share in, in, in the specialty crop market, particularly in the U.S., and Copacana has something like 70% market share uh, in supplying uh, inputs to sugarcane growers in Sao Paulo State. So if we partner effectively with those, frankly, I think we should be able to gain um, as good a market share as if we were selling uh, through Monsanto or, or, or Bayer, because frankly, how do they sell into specialty crops in the U.S.? They sell through Wilbur Ellis. So I don't think we're disadvantaged at all in, in, in that sense. Now, we put benchmarks out there of, of five, in some cases, 10% market share, and we consider those market shares to be very realistically uh, uh, achievable. Can we do better than that? Uh, I think we probably could, uh, but let's demonstrate that we can get to 5% market share before we start shouting about getting to higher market shares. And are our products as good as Monsanto and Bayer? Well, frankly, um, well, they're, they're one company now. Uh, Bayer has very little in the biologicals area. They've made significant investments in the biologicals area, um, but they're really not selling uh, very much. They talk about it uh, quite a lot with investors, but they're not selling very much. So in the biologicals area, um, I think our, our products are as good as anybody's. Uh, and in many cases, and um, particularly PAC 949 against nematodes, it's going to compete head to head with uh, conventional chemicals. So I think our products are every bit as good uh, as those of, of, of Bayer. So um, then maybe I'm going to toss the next one here to, to, uh, to you, uh, Jeff. A uh, question from Michael T. Thank you for the presentation. What are the main objections you get to selling Harpeth? It's clear from testimonials the ROI is there for the buyers. So why aren't growers buying more Harpeth, Jeff? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, it, buying Harpeth is no different than other products as you enter into these markets and work with customers. Growers want to try them, um, and and they're and they tend to slow to adopt. It takes a couple of years of use before they really get on board and start using them. If we go to some of our markets where we have them well established, 
our Spanish market, for example, uh, we have very good market shares in the citrus market and also uh, in grapes. But I think it's just you have to continue to uh, uh, get growers involved. And that's one of the reasons, as Chris mentioned, we started working with these larger distributors. They have a lot more resources on the ground to help us. So as we educate them, we get them comfortable with the product. They can go out and push it with growers and really get them on board. Um, that really helps us grow. So I think it's just more of exposure to it. Getting them used to the product uh, is really what's holding us back. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and there's a really good follow-up question to that um, uh, from, from John A. So what would you say, ignoring COVID-19, what is the key challenge to get farmers to adopt your product? And what's the lead time for farmers to, to adopt? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think we're all dealing with COVID, so I wouldn't necessarily use that as a total, a total issue now. We're all used to it. I think it's just, uh, it's just exposure. You have to get growers used to it, and you also have to remember there's different types of growers. You have some growers that really like new technology, and they'll adopt it a lot quicker. Um, then you have other growers that will follow their watch. So, you know, it can be two to three years with some of these growers and some of these crops, especially a crop like sugarcane. Sugarcane, you harvest it every 12 to 16 months. So, you know, it takes a while before you see those results and then the uses go back. So it's a couple of year process as you get in to these markets. And that's why on soybeans with Soori, as we enter this market, we really want to focus on getting a large number of growers to use the product. Uh, I would be very upset if we had one grower that, you know, purchased two or 3,000 hectares. I would rather have 20 growers or, or 200 growers buying 10 hectares a piece and get them exposed to the product. We'll be much better served long in the long term. And that's really the goal that we've got for Sori and the launch is to get broad exposure and adoption to it. You're one. Thanks, Jeff. Um, the um, Roger F., you say that um, we refer to market expectations for 21 revenue. What are market expectations for 21 revenue? Um, the Arden uh, report uh, says $7.5 uh, million. Uh, we're very confident of uh, meeting those market expectations given what we're seeing uh, today. Um, there's some really um, uh, good questions coming out about pre-tech. Um, first of all, uh, Roger F., um, you, you say, is it, it's my understanding that a few months ago we were looking at mid-year year U.S. registration for 949. You're now looking at year-end. Um, just to correct you, that, that was submission for registration. Um, and for various reasons, I, I, uh, uh, we, we have decided to delay for about three months the submission of the 949 registration uh, um, submission in, in the U.S. Uh, because we believe we'll actually end up getting to market faster that way. I don't want to go into the details just now, uh, but there was a good tactical reason for, for doing that. And then secondly, Roger, you ask, did I understand that your thinking is that while in Brazil, PHC 279 is used in soy, but in the U.S. you're looking at different crops? That's absolutely correct. Now, PHC 279 is an extraordinary product. Um, and it helps plants, as Jeff has talked about in the case of Saori in Brazil, it helps plants to grow better, but it also helps with disease management. Now, soya in Brazil uh, is subject to very, very high disease pressure. Uh, and so the product really, really shines. Soy in the U.S. does not have the same level of disease pressure. It's to do with climate. In Brazil, you're growing soy largely in the, in the tropics. In the Brazil, it's not so hot. In the U.S., it's not so hot. Um, whereas the real strength of PHC 279 comes through in fruits and vegetables in the U.S., um, and we see that as being, in the, in the short to midterm, uh, a bigger opportunity for the product in the U.S. Uh, than soy. Uh, Stephen H. Um, asked a, a really interesting question. Why does Saori carry a product name, but other products carry a PHC code number? <laughs> Would marketing not be improved with a consistent naming strategy? Uh, that's a really, really good point. We are moving towards a consistent naming strategy. Um, but uh, as I just outlined, PHC 279 is addressing a very, very different market in the U.S. 
compared with Brazil. Um, we're debating uh, whether we should use Saori uh, for PHC 279 uh, globally or not. Um, uh, but Saori was specifically chosen because it's uh, it, it is particularly effective in, in, in Brazil, uh, where it has very, very positive connotations associated with, um, with the Japanese Brazilians. Um, and 949 uh, is still a code name because it's, mm, we're, we're still a little while from the market. Now, as we get closer to the market, we will start to, uh, to brand uh, 949. Um, Last question on the screen at the moment is from John A. Are you finding anything interesting with, say, vertical farming, and are you getting any take up with these producers? Um, to be honest, um, and as Jeff corrects me, uh, we, we haven't targeted vertical farming uh, at this point, uh, just for the same reason we haven't specifically targeted cannabis. Um, and that is because although there's a lot of investment going into uh, these areas, they still remain very, very small in terms of users of, of uh, any kind of agricultural uh, inputs. Um, so uh, the, the example I tend to give with cannabis is that there are a few hundreds of hectares of cannabis grown around the world, uh, and there are eight and a half million hectares of sugarcane grown. If we ever get to eight million uh, hectares of cannabis grown, we'll all be horribly high all of the time. So we, we have to <laughs> focus uh, where, where we believe the, the largest commercial opportunities are today. Um, so I would be, we would be very happy to answer more questions, but I think, uh, Paul, um, oh, sorry, there's another one come up from John A. What's the difference in price between yourself and your competitors' products? You mentioned margins are about 70%. What are you doing to try to increase this? I assume that uh, economies of scale. I tell you what, Jeff, I've been talking a lot. Why don't you answer that one? You've got great answers for that. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. You know, I think as we've looked at this market, looked at our competitors, we think their margins are probably, most of them are in the, in the low 50s, uh, in the 60s. Uh, so I think we're doing a better than average in that. As far as margins, we look at that all the time. And there's really a couple of things that, that we focus on or I focus on with the team. So number one, our in-market pricing. That's a way to get our margins up to make sure that we've got priced and we're priced in the market correctly. And then second of all, on our manufacturing. And we have some work going on right now as we enter into uh, the manufacturing of pre-tech, we're looking at, okay, what can we do to improve our margins around Harpin and in their economies of scale there? So can we move all that manufacturing to one location and get better leverage. So it's something we constantly look at. We look at margins all the time. Um, and, you know, I think as we bring pre-tech in, those margins are gonna come up. We feel like our cost of goods is a better position than where we are with Harpin today. So our overall margin uh, should come up in the coming years as those products start to hit uh, our revenue line. Thanks, Jeff. So, Paul, I think we have pretty much exhausted. You have, you have, you have covered everything. You've covered everything off, Chris. Jeff, thank you very much indeed for addressing all those questions from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, um, the team will have the opportunity to review those. Uh, Chris, perhaps I could just hand back to you just to wrap up and just get a few final words before we redirect investors to give you a bit of feedback, please. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. I hope it comes across from Jeff and myself that we're feeling very, very positive about the momentum in the company at the moment. Um, on the commercial side, particularly in US and Europe, where sales are going really, really well. Um, a few weaknesses in Brazil and Mexico, but um, the, the, the year is yet young. Uh, and based on that, we're very confident of beating market expectations this year. And we remain very, very excited about Pretech. It's such a huge opportunity, this $5 billion opportunity. Um, we've made modest increases in our investment in, in pre-tech, uh, which we believe will bring revenue forward and, and help us to reach cash positive uh, more quickly within our existing uh, reserves while uh, taking full advantage of the very, very exciting uh, potential of, of vaccines for plants and the benefits they bring to growers. So thank you very much for your support.
Fantastic. Chris, thank Jeff, thank you very much indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session? Should be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management can better understand your views and expectations. So it'll only take a few moments and be greatly appreciated by the management team. On behalf of the management team of Plant Healthcare PRC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you. And good afternoon.